This is Jennifer Jones. I just want to welcome everybody to um, our May uh, CCSRC rounds. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's session, and I want to thank all of you for joining us remotely from across Canada. Um, today, we're going to hear from our speaker, after which we'll open up the floor for any discussion, any questions that you might have. So I ask that you all please mute your, uh, your phones or devices that you've logged in through. Um, and just also a reminder that we are recording this. Uh, so uh, without any uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce our uh, presenter today. Uh, I'm very pleased to present uh, Dr. Shauna Hudson, who is, the, who is an Associate Professor and Research Division Chief in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Um, she will be presenting her work today on cancer survivorship and primary care, patient-centered research and interventions for enhancing self-care. So Dr. Hudson, I will hand it over to you. and Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Hello. Okay, great. Excellent. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today with your group. Um, I thought I would get started. Let's make sure I'm on the right screen here. Yes. I, I always like sort of face-to-face -face and so find these sorts of forums an interesting way to sort of connect with individuals. So I thought I would start out with this sort of an overall descriptor slide that sort of shows who I am and the work that I do and um, is sort of a nice foray into the work that we're doing here around cancer survivorship. So um, for those of you on the phone, I'm actually a sociologist by training, but my faculty appointment is within our Department of Family Medicine and Community Health here at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And um, I also have a faculty appointment as a full-time member in our cancer prevention and control program at our National Cancer Institute designated Comprehensive Cancer Center, which is Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Um, so, in terms of the work that I do, my portfolio of research is really focused around sort of three main areas, uh, looking at vulnerable populations, uh, looking at cancer prevention and control within primary care settings, and then um, I've actually more recently gotten into cancer survivorship, looking at sort of prevention from the other end after there's a cancer diagnosis and looking at what are the links back and forth between primary care and the oncology setting here within the U.S. And so um, just sort of in general, the work that we're really focused on in our group is looking at people who have completed their active treatment and um, focusing in on the populations who tend to be early stage um, tend to have had what uh, in the U.S. is referred to as curative therapy, so they don't have metastatic disease or spread, but um, are likely to be the folks that we're most likely to see in our um, primary care settings. And so our research is focused on that group, and as we sort of began this journey looking at the work, uh, we've been really interested in what is the role of primary care within U.S. Within US settings, what could it be given where it is, and then where are the points of most leverage that we might be able to actually make some strides and in inroads to actually enhance the care that survivors are getting within primary care settings. So for today's talk, um, my main objectives are I'm going to talk with you and talk through some of the research that we've done where we've been exploring what are patient attitudes and preferences towards survivorship within a U.S. context for follow-up care. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the cancer survivorship care within primary context. And again, with more of a U.S. focused lens, although um, we, we do have some work that's looked at scoping reviews, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Lancet paper that we have. And then I'm going to end by talking about um, the work that we have that's currently in the field. We have a randomized control trial where we're uh, testing a self-management intervention. So basically leading into why we developed the intervention tool that we did and where we're at in process. So those are my objectives for our talk today. So to get started and make sure that we're sort of all on the same page, I got an interesting question um, earlier in the week from one of the participants who asked uh, really what was my sort of concept of patient-centered care and what am I thinking about when I talk about patient-centered care? Because from his perspective and from a Canadian perspective, 
that's all of what you do. And so I wanted to put this slide up, which is um, a slide that's of the social ecological model um, that's pretty prevalent within uh, U.S. public health settings and really has sort of the patient at the center, but the patient's experience is actually informed by a variety of different contextual factors, ranging from the family and the provider and the healthcare team going up through the organizational setting in which they're treated and the practice setting. And then that's also shaped by both local, state, and national um, sort of policies and uh, practices that are happening. And so it's within that context that I'm thinking about patient-centered care. Um, We've also been sort of thinking about it from the context of the patient-centered medical home, which I think many people are probably um, conversant with. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but Rittenhouse and Shortel in 2009 talked about patient-centered care. And in their sort of thinking through what that model looks like, they basically talk about patients as, um, you know, as being active, engaged consumers. Um, who are actually focused in on their care and actually able to negotiate and talk with their care providers about what their desires are, their needs, and, um, and, and how they actually want to, to be engaged. So it's a very different sort of model than some previous models where, you know, patients uh, are less engaged or more inclined to just do what the doctors or providers say. This one actually is really focused around patients being involved. And so we did some work um, in the patient-centered medical home, and I'm going to talk through a little bit of findings with that study. But one of the, the there were several areas that we thought were actually very relevant for cancer survivors in terms of thinking through this concept of how do you actually get to the patient in the center. And so um, NCQA, which is the National Committee on Quality Assurance here in the U.S. and the leader for healthcare accreditation, has basically posited that there are six pillars of what a patient-centered medical home needs to have. And I think out of those six, there are five that are, or there are four that are extremely relevant for cancer survivors. And so um, being able to identify and manage the patient population, being able to provide care management, and then also to link survivors out to community resources for additional support, and as well being able to track and coordinate the care both within the healthcare setting, but also um, outside in the medical neighborhood, that those are some pieces that are sort of central to the patient-centered medical home framing um, that I think are actually very relevant and applicable to cancer survivors in cancer center settings. So um, at this point, what I want to do is to just sort of take you very quickly through the numbers for cancer survivorship in the U.S. so that you have a sense of what we're looking at here, and I'm sure that they're very similar in um, Canada. In terms of our current numbers, we're looking at about, I think the, actually the new numbers are 15.5 million cancer um, survivors in the U.S., and that was as of this year. And so they're expecting that these numbers are going to increase by about 30 percent, so almost 20 million in 2024. Um, which represents an increase of more than 4 million survivors in the next 10 years. And if we sort of look at who are the populations that we're going to see the most um, survivors in, the, the three that we tend to focus on in our research are those with breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer. Because as you can see from this slide, those are the populations for whom there's the largest number of um, individuals who are in, the, in that demographic. In terms of long-term care for cancer survivors, um, when there was a study that was done back in 2009 by Lori Pollock, who has um, looked at sort of the SEER, the, the cancer surveillance data for uh, the U.S and track the, what were the demographic trends in terms of who was providing care for cancer survivors. And in that particular study, um, which is probably the most comprehensive one that we have currently for the U.S., um, they found that about a third of long-term survivors are actually continuing to see their specialists or their cancer uh, team. 
after about five years of cancer survivorship. So that means about two-thirds of the population are actually going somewhere else for their long-term care. And um, when we see where they're going for long-term care, in that particular study, 75% of survivors are receiving their care from primary care providers. And as you can see from this particular graph, the breast cancer patients are in blue, the prostate cancer patients are, I'm sorry, the, uh, the numbers in blue represent six to 11 years out from their active treatment. And the red numbers represent uh, 12 or more years out from their active treatment. So you can see that as the number of years increases from when they were actively treated, the less likely they are to actually see a cancer treatment team or specialty team. Um, and so for our work, we were interested in this for a variety of different reasons. One being that the cancer demographic is rapidly aging, and so we know about 60% of our survivors are going to be over the age of 65. Um, by the time we hit 2020, they're going to have many, they're going to have multiple uh, comorbid conditions that they will have to manage, some of which are as a result of treatment, others are things that they had either before or just uh, brought them afterwards. Um, we know that 70% of the population is going to be managing comorbid conditions, and that's going to require a comprehensive medical treatment plan. And right now, sort of the current thinking is that we need to focus in on providing survivorship care plans for patients who are finishing up active treatment as a tool and a way to sort of manage complex chronic disease. And so, in the U.S., there are a number of initiatives, but one in particular that's being driven by the Commission on Cancer Research and the American College of Surgeons, which is focused on um, making sure that patients who are in active treatment actually have a care plan where you can actually document what the treatments were, and then as well, what are some of the sequelae and what are some of the um, things to look for in terms of weight and long-term effects for patients. And so currently the goal is to get to 50% of uh, patients receiving these care plans, but the numbers actually have not actually made it to that. So, um, so it's still an area that we're, we're working on, but something that the, the policymakers have really sort of honed in on as an area for intervention. In addition to sort of the care plans as an issue, in this slide I have two pieces that are up there. So one is that ASCO has recently revised what the care plan is supposed to look like. Um, and so they have given out new guidance on um, how to actually prepare them in a way that's a little bit more user friendly than it was before. And as well, I have one of the guidelines up, but the American Cancer Society within the past two years has now come out with uh, a series of guidelines for primary care providers for patients who are survivors of breast, prostate, colorectal cancer, as well as head and neck cancer. And so um, while these are great uh, resources out there in terms of being able to find information and to get lots of comprehensive information, uh, it actually presents a real challenge for folks who are actually in practice. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Um, so one of the challenges is um, actually distilling the information into something that's usable for folks who are actually practicing within primary care. And then the other um, challenge is that while it focuses in on individuals who are leaving treatment actively or in the process of leaving treatment, it really leaves out a large variety, <clears throat> a large proportion of cancer survivors who are already out in the general population. So in this particular slide, this is the, um, these are numbers that were provided by the, the American Cancer Society, rather, and it shows here in this um, particular slide that about two-thirds of our cancer survivors have actually been diagnosed um, five years or more, they're out from their treatment. And so while the new guidelines on care plans and the other pieces are great for those who are going to be act, leaving active treatment relatively soon or in the near future, they're actually not um, set up to deal with the challenges and the issues of the survivors who are in the active population now who 
are not act are not currently receiving active treatment, and that's a huge number of individuals who are out there. So, our research has really been focused on that block of individuals, people who are done with their active treatment, who would not be getting um, cancer survivorship care plans, and what are we what do we need to provide for them to uh, make their survivorship experience better? So. As I mentioned before, we've done some work. So we've done two types of work in our group here. One is focused on looking at what are the perspectives of patients and providers and how do they think about um, follow-up care and what, do they, what are their needs. And then we've also been interested in looking at what is the primary care landscape and what does that look like in terms of um, both the U.S. as well as sort of more broadly uh, what are the different models of care that are out there and that are available? And so we have a paper that was just published in The Lancet a few months ago um, where we did basically a scoping review of the literature that exists on primary care and the different models that are out there. And we actually found that there's very limited evidence about the efficacy of any of the models that were there and as well, very limited evidence um, documenting different models. So in our scoping review, we actually found that there were six models of care, which you can see on the slide, and hopefully um, you, you have in the handouts as well. And out of those six models, the one that seems to be the most prevalent we discussed, and again, this is so the scoping review actually only found 15 articles across uh, Canada, the Australia, the United States, and I think there were a few other settings where they actually, where individuals talked about the implementation of a primary care model around cancer survivorship and actually were talking about how it was actually implemented. So there were a number of articles that we found that were commentaries about how care should be implemented, but very few that were actually sort of evidentiary, evidence-based. And so out of those 15 articles, uh, the one model that seems to get, have gotten the most traction is a shared care model. Um, and then, and that sort of referenced a lot of and the work that Eva Grunfeld and Craig Earl have been doing in Canada. Um, they talk a lot of, about the challenges in terms of doing this model of care, but it, it's the one that seems to be the most prevalently discussed. And so, when I say shared care, I mean care of the patient by both the oncologist as well as the primary care doctor. And there are a number of different ways to implement it, and we sort of go into some of that in the article. Um, and, I, and just because of time, I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, it can range from a patient who is being co-managed by both providers to a, manage who, uh, to a patient who's being managed by one provider with discussion and input from the other, and so you can see the patient go back and forth in terms of where their care is provided and when their care is provided. So there's some there's a decent amount of variation in terms of shared care. Um, in addition to shared care, we also found that there were a few sort of intervention-focused primary care models where um, there were RCTs that were testing a variety of different types of interventions. And that was four of the, I'm sorry, three of the studies. Um, there were a few studies that are talked to papers that talked about a consultative or what we called an onco oncogeneralist model where you have a primary care provider who has gone for some specialized training and um, are able to assess patients within a primary care setting. And then some of the other models that are out there, they really sort of blend into sort of the integrated oncology center model, which is ASCO's um, uh, model that we see a lot in our, some of our comprehensive cancer centers here in the U.S. where you'll have a primary care provider who's integrated into the oncology team. And so patients actually will go back to the cancer center for follow-up and may have their primary follow-up um, with a, a primary care provider within that specialty setting context. And so those are sort of the four main ones that we saw. There were also some allied health professional models that were sort of case management approaches that we saw within the literature, and then sort of a designated um, primary care panel. 
um, where we would have a local practice that would care for a particular survivorship patient panel. So survivors self-selecting to go to a doctor because they've heard that this person in particular uh, deals very nicely with uh, cancer survivors in their care. So, so that was sort of the, the landscape that we found in terms of what are the, the ways in which primary care are dealing with um, cancer survivorship. So a variety of different models, very little evidence for the efficacy of one over the other, but um, a number of different options. And so sort of for us in the, in the face of a lack of strong evidence, for particularly effective strategies within primary care that we know are actually doing things. Um, our research team has really been focused on trying to understand, um, are there things that we can do to help patients facilitate the relationships with their providers to actually enhance the care um, that they're providing? So um, we started this work back in 2009 with a study that we did with chart reviews and some of our primary care practices through our practice-based research network here in New Jersey. And so we had a study where we did 750 baseline um, patient surveys with a sample that was comprised of about 109 cancer survivors and we compared them with approximately 640 non-cancer patients. And so in this particular slide, you can see that in general, the screening rates were not poor. Um, our cancer survivors actually did better than our non-cancer patients in terms of their preventive screenings for breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. So you can see that from the darker blue bars, that they're in the 70s and the 80%. So that was good news for us. Um, one of the things that we thought was interesting about the findings in this particular study is that we did both medical record reviews as well as surveys of the patients. And when we did both of those, um, those uh, data points and triangulated, one of the things that we found was that within the chart records, that there were a lot fewer um, reported instances of documentation for the breast, prostate, and colorectal screenings than what patients actually said were uh, happening in their private lives. So patients would say, I am up to date on my screening, and then in the actual primary care practice, there was not documentation that they were up to date on the screening which for us as a research team sort of begged the question of, okay, are they seeing other doctors, other specialists, or other groups? And so perhaps that's why their preventive services are not being documented. Or potentially, could there be some sort of educational issue in terms of not necessarily knowing um, which, are the, which, which tests are the tests that are um, most appropriate, and do they actually understand of the tests that we're asking about. So um, we had more questions than we did answers with that particular study. And it actually had us start to think about, you know, cancer survivors in general as a population, we actually want to see those numbers up to 100% because of their um, exposure to different therapies as well as their history of cancer. We know that they are much more likely to develop a new primary or um, a second cancer of the type that they had before. And so um, while we thought the numbers were strong, we wanted to see them at 100% and started to think about, well, what do we need to do to raise the bar and, and move that for this population? So we have done a series of studies that um, are sort of mixed methods and actually sort of speak back and forth to each other. The first study that we did was um, back in 2011-2012, where we did a qualitative um, series of interviews with breast and prostate cancer survivors who were early stage, so no metastatic disease. Um, they had to be at least two years out from their active treatment. And we were interested in what were their understandings of follow-up care. What did they want? What did they think they needed? And who did they think was appropriate to actually provide that follow-up care? And so in this particular sample, um, we were actually pulling from patients who were diagnosed in, in our comprehensive cancer center setting 
and we were comparing them with patients who are treated in community settings to see if there were going to be differences in terms of the ways in which they talked about both um, primary care as well as um, specialty care. So for us, one of the things that was rather enlightening was, you know, as we think about the Institute of Medicine um, report, Lost in Transition, um, there's four different pillars of what cancer survivorship care is. But from our patient perspective, they really only thought of cancer survivorship care as being surveillance for the cancer that they had. So screening for um, recurrence of their cancer is what they thought cancer follow-up care was. Um, the second largest thing, and that was by about a third of them, was that perhaps follow-up care actually should actually incorporate treatment effects and looking at what those treatment effects are. And then only one person in that 42-person sample actually talked about the need for care coordination, which is another pillar of what follow-up care is. So very narrow and sort of understandings of what cancer survivorship care is and follow-up care is. And so it's not surprising that given that they're really focused on cancer surveillance, that um, they actually thought in terms of who was the most appropriate to follow them up for their care, that that would be a specialist as opposed to a primary care doctor. Um, so over half of our participants um, in the call-out box talked about um, cancer specialists as being the most appropriate for their care follow-up. And then that was followed by, again, a third of patients who talked about shared care as potentially being appropriate, um, going back and forth between oncology and primary care. And um, there was nobody in the sample who thought that primary care should be the actual, um, be the only source of care for cancer follow-up care and monitoring. So, so that was an interesting finding that we thought um, sort of merited some follow-up and thought, given particularly some of the findings of um, Ava Brunfeld's group and in Canada around sort of um, looking at discharge plans and summaries and the ability of primary care to actually effectively deliver follow-up care with high um, satisfaction. Um, we just thought that was a very interesting finding in contrast with what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, so in addition to the follow their sort of narrow understandings of what follow-up care were, we took a look at that sample um, for another study. And in this case, we were interested in looking at, okay, well, is there a difference between patients who have um, high understandings of follow-up care and um, versus those with limited understanding of what follow-up care is, and then doing a two-by-two two table where we also look at patient activation. So is there a, is there a, um, a coordinate, is there a typology that you can sort of look at in terms of what types of patients might be more or less likely to follow and fall into one of the four different quadrants of the table that we have here? And so um, in that particular study, which we published in Translational Behavioral Medicine, um, we actually found that our participants, and again, these are patients who were seen in comprehensive cancer center settings and then in community um, cancer center settings, um, that there was actually an interesting U-shape in terms of the types of patients that we had who were in the study. So if you look at the top left-hand corner, um, the patients who had very little understanding of follow-up care and limited and low activation, um, they actually tended to be in our um, community settings. We had a couple of centers that were urban centers that catered to a mostly low SES population. And in that particular um, quadrant, a number of our participants actually ended up grouping. So they had very little understanding of what cancer follow-up care was. They um, had very few skills and limited motivation to seek information and to build skills. And then in terms of their activation, um, and they really had sort of a top-down relationship with their providers and sort of expected that their providers would tell them what to do 
and didn't feel that they had much responsibility in terms of having to think about sort of sharing care and sharing decision making around care. This is very different than what you see sort of advanced in the patient-centered medical home um, and some of these more sort of highly activated patient models. Um, we also had a group in the middle who were what we called low understanding of what follow-up care is, but high patient activation. And so um, we called this group sort of resting on their laurels because many of them had narratives where they talked about doing a really fantastic job of researching their community docs um, ahead of time for their treatment but then um, not really understanding what follow-up care is. And so they, they did a lot in terms of, you know, finding the right person at the right place at the right time for their treatment and expecting that that would translate into the right person at the right place and the right time for their follow-up care. And then group three, which had very detailed understandings of what follow-up care was and our higher patient activation, those tended to be the patients who were being treated in our comprehensive cancer center settings, which I will say actually have a lot more, they're sort of resource intense, they do a lot more with patient education and training, and so it wasn't surprising to us that the patients in those settings were used to having sort of um, multi-specialty um, treatment, so they expected that there would be some discussion with their care team as to what they should do that they needed to be active participants because they were actually brought into a system that modeled that sort of expectation and that behavior for them. So, and again, um, we saw some interesting uh, trends in terms of demographics. So the patients being seen in those comprehensive settings were um, higher SES, um, tended to be more white, more affluent than the patients in the other two settings. So based on some of those two qualitative studies, we decided to do um, a more quantitative survey looking at some of these dimensions and really trying to do a deep dive with a larger sample of patients. Um, we figured that because a lot of our research literature is already based on um, patient samples that are set within pretty highly resourced areas, particularly within the U.S. context, a lot of the cancer research is coming out of our comprehensive cancer center settings. Um, we wanted to actually focus then on the patients in our community settings and to see what um, was going on there. So we did a second survey study that was a follow-up, which was with 325 early stage breast and prostate cancer survivors, and that was conducted between 2012 and 2013. And about two-thirds of our sample came from academic medical centers, and a third of the sample came from um, community cancer hospitals. And what we found in that particular study was um, we were interested in looking at what were their follow-up education and information needs, and could we profile, um, come up with a profile of what patients um, we're going to be in need of which types of information. And so we ran a multivariate regression, and um, there were four areas that sort of popped out of us both significantly in terms of the analysis, but also in terms of just thinking through how do you start to target and tailor interventions moving forward. And so from this particular study, we saw that um, African Americans um, had higher needs than whites in reference to the um, information for follow-up care, and as well, patients who were sicker, so who had more um, comorbidities, actually said that they wanted and needed more information. Um, in addition, patients who talked about having worries about the future and cancer um, recurrent fears were also groups that were um, really concerned about their their follow-up care and in need of issues, in need of some support. So from that study, we then took a look at the same sample and we're interested in um, patient-centered care follow-up. And in this case, we looked at the components of primary care scale, which was, I think, um, 
originally designed by Steve Blocky and colleagues at Case Western Reserve. Um, and so it actually looks at comprehensive care, coordination of care, and personal relationships over time. And there are a number of questions that then roll up into those particular concepts. And so, again, breast and prostate cancer survivors that we looked at. And one of the things that was interesting about this analysis is that we found that they had different, depending on their type of cancer, they had different relationships with their primary care. So as you can see from this particular slide, prostate cancer survivors in general tended to have very um, strong, favorable feelings about their primary care docs across all of the different um, components of care, both comprehensive, coordination, and the personal relationships over time. Whereas um, for the breast cancer survivors, they actually rated their oncology teams as much stronger in terms of their personal relationships over time. And on some of the components of coordinate, coordinated care, so looking at um, communication and interpretation of results. But when they actually were sort of assessing comprehensive care and their judgments on that, they actually rated their primary care providers as um, the, being the ones who provided sort of the most comprehensive care for them. So again, um, thinking about what are the dimensions that would be um, leverageable for a future intervention study is what we're sort of focused in on for this. Um, I know we are coming close to our time, so I'm going to try to move really quickly through the remaining slides and, and make sure that we leave enough time for questions. Um, but I, just, I wanted to talk a little bit about patient activation. And so, again, that's a concept that keeps coming back through the patient-centered uh, medical home literature. And so we were interested in cancer survivors in general. Are they activated patients or are they not activated? And if so, um, you know, what are the areas of difference that we might want to think about in terms of trying to move them along the self-management continuum for an intervention? And so, again, we used the same sample of 325 and um, had the Hibbard patient activation measure, which is 13 questions that were included within the survey. And in general, what we found for this particular um, study was that patient activation across both groups is actually very high. So the, the PAM actually has an interesting gradation on it. And so for the patients who we saw, they were very high in terms of their activation. Breast cancer survivors tended to be higher than prostate cancer survivors in general. Um, but there were, it was interesting that for both of our groups, um, when we looked at some other things that were associated with activation, um, their access to their oncology team and their primary care physicians, that was actually something that was positively associated with higher levels of activation. So the more activated they were, the more they said they had access to their care teams, both oncology and primary care. And then also the amount of time that they perceived that they spent with their docs was higher. So again, the more active that they were, the more time they actually had with their teams, which again sort of makes sense if you think about it from sort of the setting expectations and thinking through um, what are the, the issues and how do we sort of um, move through different pieces. So I'm sort of rounding out our last two studies here, which is um, we actually are now moved into a intervention study where we are, I'll show you the study design in the next series of slides, but part of what we did for our descriptive work up front was to get a sense of um, risk and communication with survivors and their um, primary care docs. And so in this sample, we actually surveyed 38 breast cancer survivors. About half of them were overweight or obese as measured by their BMI. And one of the things that was really interesting about the findings in this qualitative study were that um, most of our survivors actually said that they didn't actually have weight discussions with their providers, even though they're breast cancer survivors who are overweight, who um, having a weight discussion actually would be important and informative and useful for helping to shape their follow-up care. 
none of them had had, well, actually half of them had not discussed it. And then of those who did discuss it with their providers, a third of them actually had to initiate the conversations themselves. And so, again, another area that we thought might be right for leveraging in terms of patient interventions and self-management interventions. So I want to close out with um, sort of the last of our empirical studies with um, one where we actually looked at the landscape of primary care innovations around survivorship care, both here in the U.S., and we actually had one Canadian participant, uh, several Canadian participants on the panel. So um, one of my colleagues, Ben Crabtree, has an R13 study that just, or an R13 grant, which is a conference grant that was funded by um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC. Um, and in that study, he was, or in that particular project, the conference series, they were interested in a series of different issues around the patient-centered medical home and how things get implemented. And one of the areas that they did as a breakout was around survivors, cancer survivorship innovation. And so they did sort of a rolling snowball sample where we um, had a group of um, the experts in the field recommend to us people that they knew who they thought were doing some really innovative work around cancer survivorship and cancer survivorship care. They brought them together for a two-day working meeting to talk about what were they doing within their setting and what were sort of the, um, the areas where they were able to leverage as opposed to the areas where they were having um, issues in terms of um, moving the cancer survivorship um, portfolio forward. And so in that particular setting and in that meeting, um, we basically looked at a series of uh, push and pull factors, the motivations of the stakeholders, um, both outside as well as those of the internal person who are making changes and, and really pushing the survivorship um, agenda within their settings, and then looking at both resources for change and opportunities for change. And so um, in this paper, we talked about, we really sort of go through a series of case studies um, where individuals talk about being champions of this and being really motivated and interested in pursuing survivorship care, but also being cognizant of the fact that they're in systems of care where survivorship care is actually not rewarded. And in fact, a lot of the sort of policy things that are happening and the reward systems are set up to not support that care. So, um, so it, it's been interesting because in one hand, a lot of individuals talk about the importance of cancer survivorship within primary care, but it seems like the landscape is set up in such a way that it makes it difficult, at least within the U.S. setting, to actually get traction around um, payment reform and some of the other things that would help to facilitate better follow-up care within the setting. And also a lot of the, the policy issues are coming not from primary care, but it's coming sort of top down from oncology. And so a real sort of discussion around how do we get primary care more engaged in the discussion so that it's, we have tools that are meaningful for all of the folks around the table. So let me just quickly finish up. Um, basically, this is a summary of um, what we found in terms of our patient studies. And so in terms of patient studies, we found that activation was pretty high. We found that there were some populations who wanted more guidance and needed more guidance. We also found that folks with particular health risks were not getting the care that um, we would necessarily want them to get or the discussions around weight management and some of the other issues that should be coming up within follow-up care. And then also within sort of the, the landscape of the primary care setting, um, some of the issues that came out of both the Lancet paper and also the, the one that I just referenced are that there are really no standards of care for survivorship care models. So that's a, a concern for those who are doing work. Um, that there's primary care guidelines for survivorship, but there's really not a strong evidence base at this point. 
And also that we have lots of really committed and willing providers who will provide care, but they're also providing care within a context of competing demands and so um, limited in terms of the reach that they are able to do. So I realize this is a really busy slide and um, I'm going to just talk to you through really quickly what we're doing here and then open it up for questions. So, um, what we have now is a randomized control trial. So it was an implementation study framework. And so they wanted us to design a study that would actually take patient-centered um, patient views into effect or into account in the development of the intervention. Um, and then test it in a small scale efficacy trial within primary care settings. And the goal was to both do the efficacy test, but also to look at the process of doing the work. So what we proposed is in mHealth, um, basically it's a mobile enhanced website that helps patients to um, organize their care. And then we also have a health coaching uh, piece that we're testing. So in the forearms, we're gonna be looking at the health coaching the um, the web the mobile enhanced website and then an arm that gets both of those versus a control arm that receives some uh, documentation from the National Cancer Institute facing forward is the brochure that we're using. Um, I think I'm going to skip through these slides mainly because I want to be able to have some time for questions and to sort of show you sort of to end here on this formal piece with. Uh, basically, what we ended up with is a website that has all the recommendations that are tailored for patients. So they put in information about their profile, their type of cancer, when they were treated, and um, what types of treatment they received. And then there's an algorithm in the website that actually then tailors and pulls up materials that are relevant for them. And so it lists them under recommendations. It also has um, an area where you can ask questions. And so it has a series of different things about late and long-term effects and um, healthy lifestyle behaviors and other pieces like that. And as well, the health coaching um, modules, which we're going to do for over a six-week period, are similarly structured to address all of those key issues. So um, with that, I think I'm going to actually stop and open it up for questions.